Romans 5, and today we come to verse 12 through 14, and uh, I wish that we would read the whole passage, Romans 5, 12 to 21. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. For the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. The free gift is not like the resort of, what, of that one man's sin. For the judgment follows one trespass, brought condemnation. But the free gift, following many trespasses, brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to, in to increase the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, this is such a glorious passage before us, reminding us not just of Adam, but also of Christ. Reminding us not just of the original sin, but also of free righteousness through Christ. Lord, we thank you for the way the scriptures have been written. So that by its instruction, we, made, we might have hope. And this morning, Lord, we wish that you would minister to our souls. And help us to know you. To hear from you. And that each one of us would be profited by the hearing. The proclamation of your word. In the name of our gracious Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I have a question to you this morning, <clears throat> and the question is, are you in Adam or in Christ? Are you in Adam or in Christ? Now, I ask that question knowing very well that all people everywhere want to put themselves in the best place, the best possible position, in the best possible circumstances. And this is seen every time when you try to bring the gospel to people. Last week, trying to bring the gospel to people, I would ask them the question, are you going to heaven or to hell? And what do you think is the answer? Everyone thoughtlessly says, I'm going to heaven. They don't even think about it. I'm going to heaven, everyone would say. Because everyone wants to be in the best possible circumstance. But the truth is, the only people who are going to heaven are those who are in Christ, not 
every Tom, Dick, and Harry and Mary. It's those who are in Christ. So when I ask the question, are you in Adam or in Christ, it's very easy to say, uh, although I don't know what being in Adam means, I am in Christ. Because being in Christ is far better. So, I'm sure you would say that you are in Christ. But the question is, are you really, are you surely in Christ? Because what does it mean to be in Christ? What does it mean even to be in Adam? God does not view you as simply an individual like Melchizedek, who has no father or mother or genealogy. We all have our parents. In fact, if I may remind you, each one of us was born with an umbilical cord connected to his own, his own mother. And most of us resemble our parents. That shows that there is a connection between you and your folks. There's a connection between you and Adam, and me too. So please, don't write the heading of this message, Are you in Adam or in Christ? Write, Am I in Adam or in Christ? That's what you should write on your notebook if you're taking the notes. Because this is not a question for theological discussion, it's a question for you to answer this morning. Am I in Adam or in Christ? The default mode for every person born is not to be in Christ. That's not the default mode. You are not in Christ by your coming to church or by your being born in your Christian family. No. Your default mode is being in Adam. Your factory setting is in Adam. So if you press the button restore factory setting for you, it would go back to being in Adam, not in Christ. So, we are connected to Adam by sin. There is that original sin. So, Adam, his sin his guilt, his curse have been imputed to you and me. So, behind all our personal sinning, that is behind all our pride, behind all our idolatry, behind all our lies, behind all our insubordination, behind all our lusts, behind all our personal sinning is this monster called the sinful nature inherited from Adam our father the sin this sinful nature has affected us from birth and thus we we sin because we are sinners by nature adam's sin is with us, affecting us. Adam's sin gave bearing to our own personal conduct. So, behind all our depravity, our own personal sinning is this original sin. And you're thinking, you are dragging us into these theological debates that you theologians have. No. 
Let me make it very practical to you. Last week again, someone asked me, what happens to the children who die in infancy? Do they go to heaven or do they go to hell? And what was my answer to that question? I said, I don't know. I don't know what happens to those children who die in infancy. Do you? Is there anyone who knows what happens to the children who die in infancy? Children who are miscarried or the children who die? A day old, an hour old, whatever age, but they die in their infancy before they can respond to the gospel with faith in Jesus Christ and repenting of their sins. Do you know what happens to them? I don't. Now, this person who asked me the question said, no, I don't accept that answer that you do not know. You are a pastor, you should tell me. I've been grappling with this question for a long time. You have to tell me. And he said, I'm not, he said, I'm not leaving you until you tell me. I said, no. What we can do is we would work out what we know and separate what we know from what we do not know. So what do we know? This is what the Bible says. Psalm 51, verse 5. This is David speaking in confessing his sins. I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. That's what David says. He was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did his mother conceive him. So was he a sinner in the womb or was he not? He was a sinner, right? Because of this original sin inherited from Adam. That's why he says that. That's one thing. That's one truth to be known. It's there in the Bible. The other truth is this. John the Baptist while he was in his mother's womb, the Bible says that he was spirit-filled. He was spirit-filled. It's there in Luke chapter 1, verse 41. So John, the very first Baptist, was his spirit filled in his mother's womb. That's another truth that we know. Now, there is another truth that we know about children in infancy. We have two children who are twins conceived by their mother at the same time. They are together in the womb, and this is what the Bible says Jacob, I loved. Esau I hated while they were still in their mother's womb when the Bible says they had done neither good nor bad. And we shall be talking about that when we get to chapter 9 of Romans. Verse 11 says that in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works but because of him who calls, because they were yet unborn and are not done either good or bad. So what is the answer then to that question? What happens to the children who die in infancy? The answer is, I do not know. Because some of them go to hell and others go to heaven. If they are elect so that God's purpose of election might stand. It's not because they've done any 
good or bad, if we may go by what is there in Romans 9, 11, it's because God himself in his grace chooses some out of a group that is all rotten in sin, lost in sin, inherited from Adam. And so it's out of his mercy. I'm saying all this to prepare you for chapter 9, but to show you that there is a practical connection to this truth here. Therefore, the Bible says, just as sin came into the world through one man, it never left. It doesn't begin at birth. It doesn't begin at one year. It begins at conception. Because that is our nature. That's why I said our default mode, our factory setting is that we are sinners. That's what we are. And so our confession of faith, then uh, let's see whether that answer, I don't know, is a fair answer. Because God is the one who determines what happens to them. Our confession of faith in the 19th chapter, the second paragraph says, Elect infants dying in their infancy are regenerated and saved by Christ through the Spirit who works when and where and how he pleases. How does he work? He works when and where and how he pleases so also are all other elect persons who are incapable of being outwardly called by the ministry of the word. That's the most comforting truth. That even though our factory setting is seen as, God is pleased to choose some for eternal life. And by his spirit works when, where, how he pleases. The verse tells us that Adam brought sin to all men. And sin brought death to all men. And thus, no one is born innocent. No one is born sinless. All born sin. That's why Jesus himself had to be conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. So what am I saying? My dear brothers and sisters and friends, you are either in Adam or in Christ. Don't tell me that you're neither in Adam, neither in Christ, and you are there, there. No. You're either in Adam or in Christ. The entire human race is in Adam. That's the first thing. And the next thing that we will consider next week is being in Christ. What does it mean? And that's a very fitting Christmas message. Being in Christ. But today let's look at the backdrop. Being in Adam. What does it mean? You're generated from Adam. And so you are included in his sin. So when Adam sinned, all human beings sinned. And when Adam died, all died because, of the pro because the process of death began with him out of his sin. But someone might say, wait, wait. How can I be blamed for being in Adam? And that's natural. What could I have done? It is innate in me to do so, to be so. It's true. But you were born in and with sin, and yes, 
you're acting in accordance to your nature, but you're responsible for what you do. And so you take responsibility for being born in Adam. And even though you, it was beyond your capacity, God says that that's your case. I need to make it clear here that there are basically two interpretations of this text and so many theologians would argue about whether it's it this way or is it that. But those who say that being in Adam means that we were in the loins of Adam. We were there sinning with him. You know, like when the old of Hebrews in, in Hebrews 7, 9 to 10 describes how Levi paid his tithe to Abraham, excuse me, to Melchizedek. Levi, being in the loins of Abraham, paid his tithe to Melchizedek. And thus he was there in that way. This is called realism. Meaning, our souls were there with Adam. And there is a variation of that, which is what is adopted by Jonathan Edwards, where he says that, well, we were not quite there in that sense, but we were there in the, minds of, in the mind of God, who knows everything and knows the end from the beginning. Now, uh, that's not the position that is orthodox. The orthodox position is that we were there in the sense that Abra uh, Adam represented us because his name, what does it mean? Adam means mankind. Uh, he is the federal head of the whole human race. So this is what is called federalism. It's not realism, it's federalism. He represented us, and his sin was imputed to us. Let me illustrate this. When the present political regime took the reins of power in 2013, do you know what was the public, what was the percentage of the public debt? It was 39%. And by June this year, the percentage had leaped to 69%, which is a total of 7.7 .7 trillion Kenya shillings. My friend, that's what you owe. That's what you owe in public debt. But you say, wait a minute. Why do you say I owe that money? I've never seen that money. I didn't borrow that money. I don't know how they borrowed, when they borrowed. I did not agree with it. Of course, you didn't agree with it. I didn't agree with it either. And my own understanding is that we should live within our means. But we don't. So who is going to pay these 7.7 .7 trillion Kenya shillings. Who? Oh, it's, it's, it's Mr. Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta, right? Is he the only one who's going to pay that debt? Oh, is it going to be with him and his treasury cabinet secretary? Who is going to pay that, this debt? It is you and me and our children. And why is that? Because Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta and his government represents you and me, and so we bear responsibility for his actions. That is what is called federalism. And that's what happened in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3. So, we bear responsibility, even though we did not agree with it. We pay to the last coin. 
and with interest and with all the, uh, the currency fluctuation. And so when your fender head does something, it affects not just him, but also his children. And so if I took a bank loan and I was unable to pay, and uh, I put my house as the security, they will not come and kick me out and leave my family in that house, will they? They will come kick me out along with my children, and my children will bear responsibility for my actions. That's federalism. That's what happened. Yes, you may say, but yeah, I understand the bit about uh, the government, Mr. President, taking debt on my behalf because I chose him. I chose his representation. But I didn't choose Adam. Neither did you choose your father. So you see, our representative Adam was impeccably chosen by God for us, and in the same way our fathers, our parents, were impeccably chosen by God for us, and God has also appointed them to be our representative. But that's not all. God has also chosen another representative for us. Jesus Christ, his son. Amen. So I have a number of things to say to you regarding being in Adam. First of all, notice this. Being in Adam means sin came into the world. In Genesis 3, sin came into the world. Whereas God had told Adam and Eve not to eat the fruit out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they did. Sin came into the world by the instigation of Satan upon Eve and Eve upon Adam, but Adam was ultimately responsible before God. And so God directed his initial questions of accountability to Adam. And God puts that responsibility not on Eve, but on Adam who is a fender of hand. Adam and his wife and that's all of us sinned against God. When they ate the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil against the instruction of God, it was at the risk of death, both spiritual and physical death. And so when this when they did that, when they sinned against God, sin came. Sin entered into the world. And as a result, all his offspring, all his progeny were affected. And we are his. And so we are born in sin. We are conceived in iniquity. Adam's sin was imputed or reckoned, remember that word, or accounted or credited upon all men. Adam being the originator of humanity, all his became ours since he is our father. And that's our federal hand. That's our representative. So human race was immediately plunged into sin, and so death spread to all men. Sin came into the world through one man. Adam's disobedience affected him and all his offspring. He had us into this sinful nature, and his sin was imputed to us all. No one is exempt this is, uh, uh, from this sinful nature. All of us are sinful. No one is without original sin. Secondly, because sin came into the world through the one man, 
then all sinned and died even before the law was given. Because the Bible says sin was indeed in the world before the law was given. The evidence of this is that there was death in the world before the law. Sin reigned supreme. Thus, there was the universal flood. So that, so that even though Sinai's law were not yet given, yet God's laws were still actively instructing God's people. He, he wrote about the law earlier when he said, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Because once you eat of it, you shall surely die. As soon as Paul mentions that all sinned, he clarifies that this includes even those who lived on earth before Adam and Moses, I mean before Moses, before the law was given. And the law was given, <clears throat> that phrase is, the, the significance of Moses was the giving of the law in Mount Sinai. But the point is this. Sin did not wait for the law to be given, for it to reign supreme. Sin was capturing souls of men and killing them. So, let's consider that fact that all sinned. But the truth is that we do not only ha we have two things to prove that we have sinned. The first one is that we die. Human beings die. Because the wages of sin is death. The soul that sins shall surely die. So death is a proof that there is activity of sin in the world. But the second proof of sin is that we actually sin. We ourselves commit sin. Sin as the original sin has affected us and causes us to want to sin, to desire to sin. And we actually do. So we lie. We steal, we lust, we are proud, we are arrogant. We fail to love God as we ought and love other things. We, we do things that we should not do. We covet. This is our personal sinning. It's another proof that all sin. And all sin there includes not only unbelievers, but also believers. Believers also sin. And so John writes and he says, whoever says in his heart that he does not sin, there is no truth in him. He is deceived. And again, he says he calls God to be a liar there in 1 John 1.10 and 1.8. So all have sinned, all men. It means no one is excluded. That is everyone without exception. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God is what he has already said there in Romans 3.23. No one does good. No, not one. All have turned aside and together they've become worthless. This is the scriptural emphasis. None is righteous. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All, without exception, have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. No one does good. No, not one. That's a quotation from Psalm 14 and, and Psalm 53. And it's quoted there uh, extensively in Romans 3, 10 to 18. That's a scriptural emphasis of the universality of sin. Sin is universal. Therefore, all men 
well, as well as women, young and old, rich and poor, all sin. You sin and I sin. And all sin and this to our shame. But the point is that we sin. We sin because we are, have this natural inclination to sin. We have this sinful nature. But the Bible says in verse 14 that our sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But our sinning is not like the transgression of Adam. Now that's interesting. Well, what does it mean that our sinning is not like the transgression of Adam? Did Adam have original sin? Did Adam have original sin? Yes or no? Yes? No? Yes? No? What's the answer? You don't know. Can you say yes or no, please? You don't know. <laughs> now, obviously, he didn't have original sin. Come on. Where from? Where, where could he have gotten it? Adam did not have original sin. He had no reason to sin. Because he was created by God in his image without any sin. Because God said everything he made was very good. So Adam didn't have original sin. He had original righteousness. But he sinned. And the sinfulness of the state in which Adam brought us there right now consists of the guilt of that very first sin. But because of that reason, it also consists of the lack of original righteousness. Although Adam had it because Adam destroyed it. But it also includes the, the corruption of our whole nature. That is original sin, along with all actual transgressions which proceed from it. That's us. So that's the difference between Adam's sinning and our sinning. Whereas it can be said in light note that Adam did not have a reason to sin, it can be said for us that we have a reason to sin because Adam, in his sinning, rendered us helpless. He gave us that sinful nature. We are born in it, born with it. And what do you think now is the result of this? It is that death spread to all men through sin. Death is used here not just as a reference to physical death, but also to spiritual death. Whereas most will experience physical death, we don't say all will experience physical death because Jesus Christ will return and people will be wonderfully transformed. I don't think I'd be there, but anyway, I might be there. But the point is this, not everyone will taste physical death. And then there, there will be those who will never taste eternal death because there is both physical death and eternal death because they are in Christ. Because the Lord Jesus Christ has redeemed them from it. And the point is this, that since sin is universal, death is also universal. And I've always said that if you are old enough to die, then you are old enough to be saved. There can be no sin 
unless there is law, is the other thing to notice. The law. Because sin is defined as a transgression of the law of God. And if there is, if there is law, then it can be broken. And if the law has been broken, then there is the penalty. And the penalty is death. For the law says the penalty of sin is death. And, and the soul who sins shall surely die. And the wages of sin is death. So Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says, For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall be made alive. First Corinthians 15, 21 and 22. So it is clear that there are only two human federal hands, Adam and Jesus. If you're in Adam, you have his sins and your sins too. You have his guilt and you have your own guilt too. And you will surely die as he died if you're in Adam. Because sin and death spread to all men because all sinned. But the last thing that this text says is that Adam was a type of the one who was to come. In which way was Adam a type of the one who was to come? And who is the one who was to come? It's Christ. So how is Adam a type of, the, of Christ? What is the resemblance between them? Just as Adam gives or passes on what is his to those who are his. Did you hear that? Adam passes that which is his sin to those who are his. Us. So he passes on transgression and curse and death. That's exactly what Christ does. So Christ does pass on to his people that which belongs to him. That is his righteousness and and life and blessing to those who belong to him through faith. So there is what is called imputation. To impute. When you tell someone, do not impute motive, what are you saying? You are imputing your motive to me. What does that mean? You what you desire as your motive is what you are imputing, you are crediting to me. That's what happens. So in Christ, who perfectly fulfilled all the demands of the law and thus purchased our redemption, there is a reversal of the fall of Adam. For even the penalty of sin, which is death, that was due to us. He took it and died our death and purchased our full redemption, our full pardon, our full salvation. That's what Christ did. So Adam is federal head of humanity and Christ is, is a federal head of the elect out of the humanity. All human beings live under this influence of our federal hands. Thus all men live under the power and the deceitfulness of their corruption dwelling in them, having been obtained from Adam with a prevailing temptation, falling into sins and provocations. But thankfully, God in his mercy has provided that some people come under the tender headship of Christ and be regenerated by his life-giving spirit. So what is the correspondence? What is the relationship between Adam and Christ? They both represented humanity. 
Adam's transgression led to sin, curse, and mystery, and death, whereas Christ's obedience reversed this tragedy and brought blessing, life, and salvation. So if you're in Adam, you shall die. But if you're in Christ, you shall live. And none is outside the realm of both. There are those who are, in, uh, who are thus in Adam. But by God's mercy are brought by His saving grace to be in Christ and thus to be children of God. So, if you're in Christ, then you're not in Adam. But if you're not in Christ, you are in Adam. And no one is outside of them both. And you cannot be both in Christ and in Adam. You cannot, you cannot be A, none, B, Adam, C, Christ, and D, both. There are only two answers that are true there. It's either in Christ or in Adam. And it's not in both. And it's not in none. But you can only be in one at one time. So the answer is one. Are you in Christ or in Adam? And I've sought to show you what being in Christ means and what being in Adam means. My emphasis to do today has been being in Adam. So, let's, let's try to, 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 to apply this message then. First of all, notice that you are in Adam by birth. It's not a choice you make. Just as you did not choose your father and your mother, you do not choose whether to be in Adam or not. We are all born this way, with original sin, with sinful nature. Thus, everyone is implicated in the sin of Adam. And the proof of this is both your own sins and death. Secondly, in Adam you remain in your sins. It's not a good thing being in Adam, because you remain in your sins. If your federal head is Adam, which is your default mode, then you remain in your sins. You die in your sins. You continue in your sins and will bear all the misery of your sins. Remaining in your sins is too costly. It is unbearable because your conscience will forever accuse you. You will have no peace of mind and of heart in that state and you will not know the joy of the Lord. And then thirdly, in Adam, you pay, you pay for your sins. One problem with being in Adam is that he does not pay for your sins. No, he won't. Adam does not pay and cannot pay for your sins. So in Adam, you pay for your sins. If your fender head is Adam and you remain in your sins, then you are liable to the sins of Adam, the curse of Adam, the misery of Adam, the death of Adam, the eternal separation from God, not just by the cherubs and the seraphim, but, or by the flaming sword, but by hell. And all the pains of it. The reason why you don't stop sinning is because you are in Adam. And the reason why you cannot afford to remain in Adam is because you have to bear the full force, all the consequences of your sins. And the consequences are eternal. You cannot afford this. And finally, being in Adam, there is no salvation. Adam cannot save himself. Adam cannot save you. 
I mean, if Adam cannot save himself, how can he save anyone? So there is no deliverance of sin in Adam. You have to be willing to come to this point where you say, but thanks, who will deliver me from this body of sin? But thanks be to God who gives me victory in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because there is only one hope for your soul. And the hope, the only hope of, hope of salvation is in Christ Jesus. He's the only redeemer of God's elect who being the eternal son of God became man and so was and continues to be God and man in two distinct natures and one person forever. This is Christ. He is our only confidence, our only hope. Christ is our hope and confidence both in life and in death. Let's rise up to praise his name.